In the spring of 1969, in Asbury Park, New Jersey, a very special car was ordered, a Fathom Green JL8 Z28 Camaro. Over half a century later, the car has been meticulously restored to its day one glory. A JL8 Z28 is really rare because they made roughly 20,000 Z28 out of nearly a quarter million 1969 Camaros. And they only made 206 JL8 Camaros. And the whole purpose was to homologate that, that uh, feature for Trans Am Racing because they wanted to be able to use the four-wheel disc brakes in Trans Am Racing. So they had to build so many vehicles for retail consumption for the street in order to use uh, the four-wheel disc brake package. I've since found out that they only offered the four-wheel disc brakes from February through May of 1969. And this car was built the last week of May of 1969. So had he not ordered it when he did, then he wouldn't have been able to get this option on that car. This is a car I've always been interested in because I like rare cars and I like cars with purpose and in order to go fast on a track I've done some track driving and done some SCCA autocross that kind of thing and in order to go fast you have to be able to stop and this car was designed to have very strong brakes in order to perform well on the track uh, because they're not just four-wheel disc brakes they're four piston caliper Corvette style four-wheel disc brakes and it was done in a time where no car sold in the United States by an American manufacturer had four-wheel disc brakes except for the Corvette. Well, I, I've always been into cars. I like to go fast, uh, so I like to stop. <laughs> uh, my first car was a 55 Chevy, which uh, I eventually put a 327 engine in it and discovered okay. that it could go better than it could stop. Right, And I sort of made up my mind at that point that I, the next car would have four-wheel disc brakes. In either Hot Rod Magazine or Car and Driver, I don't remember which, I'd read that uh, Chevrolet was going to come out with four-wheel disc brakes on the Camaro. Okay, so you read about it in the magazine. And yeah. I, yeah, so I went to the dealer and I said, I'm looking to buy one of these with uh, four-wheel disc brakes. <clears throat> and the dealer told me that, uh, he says, uh, we, they don't, Chevrolet doesn't make anything like that. I said, uh, well, okay. I said, I read about it. I think, I think, it's, uh, I think I'm right. Uh, if you want to look it up uh, and get back to me, uh, I'll buy it if you can get it with four-wheel disc brakes. And so I left, and he called about a week later and said, well, we think you can get it with four-wheel disc brakes, but we have no idea what it'll cost. I said, well, let's order it. Well, I was surprised when I first looked at this car because I knew they only made 206 cars with JL8 brakes. And this car, out of 
all the Z28s I've seen, and, and because they made 20,000, it's still at a big auction. It's very common to see a couple few dozen 69 Z28s that made so many of them. I had never seen this color combination before where you had Fathom Green, which is a fairly common color, but the medium green base interior is not very common. That medium green color, even though they call it medium, most people would describe it as a light green, a celery green that was common on Pontiacs, Oldsmobiles, Chevrolets of that era. And it's just not a color that a restore is normally going to uh, put a car back to original condition in because when you order those green parts, and there's so many of them, they come in in so many different shades, it's very difficult. Now, how, when, when you, you mentioned the colors, what, what made you select these colors? Because I, I can tell you from looking, I've been around a lot of cars and I've never seen this color combination at all. Um, the Fathom Green was pretty popular actually on the outside, mm -hmm. but what, what made you think of the Fathom Green to start with? Just a color you liked at the time? Just, yeah, it's just a color I liked. They, everybody was pushing for black on the inside, and I thought, that's just too hot. Uh, and so the light green, I thought, went well with the car. It actually does. It actually, it actually does work well. A lot of people, I think the reason they, when they changed the color, they didn't do that interior is because it's very, very difficult. And uh, David, I tell you, he, he worked so hard. That was one, I think, was that probably one of the most challenging parts of the restoration, Dave, was the interior. Yeah, because finding, because, you, you know, like the seats would be one color, then you get a headliner be another shade of green, then the package tray another color, then the carpet's different, the dash, and all of a sudden everything looks very, very different. But mm -hmm. uh, how did uh, they react at the dealership when they got the car? Was there much, uh, did they pay much attention to what it was, or did they even, even care or understand back then? They, 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 it was a car. They sold the car. That's, that was their attitude. I don't, I don't think they, well, the, Nobody at the dealership knew about this, that, that you could get it with four-wheel disc brakes. And I was kind of silly because I walked in saying that's what I wanted. Right. <laughs> More than the car, I wanted the four-wheel disc brakes. Did you have friends? I was just curious if you had buddies or friends that kind of knew about the, the four-wheel disc brakes or were they into that at all back then? Oh, uh, all my friends raced cars. so They did? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so uh, I, I heard a rumor that you had this car up to a pretty high speed at one time. I did. I set a land speed record in New Jersey with it. <laughs> <laughs> how, how fast did you drive that car at one time? 145 miles an hour. You actually drove the car 145 miles an hour? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, wow. wow. Well, when I first saw the car way back in January of 2013, I looked at the trim tag, actually, and I noticed that the car was, although the car was a numbers matching, uh, car and it was close to original, nothing about the appearance was original. The interior was wrong, the paint scheme was wrong, it's a very pretty car and a well done car and I figured at the time that's why the car didn't sell at the two auctions where I saw the car is because that really bothered the buyers apparently that even though it was a correct original JL8 full disc brake Camaro Z28 and it was built in Norwood and it was a true X77 car it was the wrong color and the wrong interior. There was too much that was wrong with it as, as nice as the appearance was. Well, after decoding the protective plate, uh, first off, having the protective plate is one of the main reasons I had a lot of interest in this car because that proves that the car was an original four-wheel disc brake car. Uh, in the classic car market, it's very, very important to have provenance and proper documentation. And having a protective plate is very, very important. And the protective plate actually not only tells you that it was a, a 373 ratio rear axle with four-wheel disc brakes, but it actually has the date stamped uh, when the axle was made, and that same date stamp is in the axle of the car that matches the protective plate, uh, just like the engine stamp is also uh, on the protective plate. So I knew that the car was legit. David Fair has been restoring cars and working on classic Corvettes and Camaros in the Tampa Bay market for the past 50 years. He's very, very experienced. Uh, he's a one-man show. Uh, he's located right here in Plant City. And David Fair had actually done the restoration on another fairly rare Camaro that, that, that I have as a 1969 396 SS Camaro. And I was so amazed when I first saw that car I had just never seen quality at that level 
and I'm very particular about looking at the quality of a restoration. That's what really makes a restoration special is when it's done at such a high level of quality that it, it just is amazing. And that's why I wanted David Fair to be the one, if he was able to do it, to be the one to restore the Z28 because I knew that it was important if we were going to put it back to the original condition, it needed to be done uh, to the absolute highest level. It's difficult because it's just so time consuming and you have to go back over everything and uh, so many times to get st stuff you know, like you want it, that it takes so much time and it can be aggravating and, and all that. This car has a lot of paint markings on the front. What, what are the reasons that the, talk about the reasons well, for the paint markings? they say that those are inspection marks, like uh, could be heat treating or something like that, and they put those marks on there to show that that had been done. And, and some of them may be from torquing or... So the whatnot. manual actually gives you an idea of what's supposed to go on, what type of paint markings, mm -hmm. what color they were, that kind yeah, of thing, yep. to make it look authentic? Yep, yep. I noticed also you got like a Delco tag on the backing plate for the yep. rotor, and yep. then on the spring it's got a tag. Yeah, that's, that's, all, that's all original, the way it came there with the tags on the backing plates, and the, the springs got the tags to tell which weight springs they are and, uh, and I noticed the gray painted you know they would have would they have been gray painted from the factory or how they would have been when they're new no they were natural metal but they tended to rust so we put something on them so they look like so natural just metal, bare metal so they got rusting. that surface rust by the time mm -hmm. they got to the dealer's mm -hmm. lot so now of course this car a lot of premium cars have disc brakes this one's special because it's got four-wheel disc brakes Talk a little bit about why these disc brakes are different from what a normal GM disc brake would be. Yeah, these are very rare, the JL8 option, uh, four-wheel disc brakes on this car. And uh, the, the calipers are like the Corvette calipers, four-piston calipers. Uh, very, so it's actually got, very it's got, actually got hydraulic pressure on both sides, mm -hmm. not just on one side with a slide, correct? Yeah, very much better than the stock brakes. Okay, I see more inspection marks on the steering uh -huh. on both sides as well yep. by the yep. by the grease zerts. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll notice, I noticed the the uh, when you did the the engine here, we got overspray going onto the bell housing where part of it's painted orange like the motor and part of it's aluminum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the way they came. They painted these motors very quickly, and whatever got on the bell housing with the paint just got on there, and they didn't. They didn't try to paint the whole thing, so that's just the way it was. And the bottom of the cars, with this, is this correct? It'd be like a satin black. That's kind of how they painted them? Uh, really, they didn't have much paint on them, and they tended to rust very quickly. But and that all. way it kind of so, lasts a little better? Yeah, so we tend to go with the satin black over the most of the, the car. Oh, I get everything that I can from anywhere I can, you know, and, and uh, you have to decipher through it and everything and all. But you know, nowadays you got the internet. You know, years ago when I started working on cars, you didn't have that. You know, and uh, most of what you learn is either from a book or from actually working on the cars. And moving moving back just a little bit, I noticed they uh, they flatten the, the exhaust pipes mm -hmm. kind of in the middle just for ground clearance. Is that right? Yep. How I the believe factory so. pipes work? I believe that's what that was. And then you got an orange and a white stripe on the the drive shaft. Yep, that's to uh, tell the application of the drive shaft as far as to the engine. And so they know it was a mm -hmm. it was a 302 V8 engine with a four speed. I guess is that the transmission one? Right. right. Okay. And these holes are real interesting. You rarely see these these uh, holes that have a plate in them with a, with a sealer on both sides. Talk about why those are, are like that. The other is a silver plate. Yes. Uh, when they built the car. These holes was where it was mounted to the uh, cart that went on the assembly line. And then after the car was all done and they pulled it off the cart, they had to plug these holes. So they just dropped them in there with a the little sealer. And, and that's why they're just, they're different from mm -hmm. the rest that's of the bottom. That's why they're different. They weren't painted with the car. And I noticed this, uh, this car has resonators. That was kind of new about this time, wasn't it, mm -hmm. on this car? This car here, yeah. I think it was this month that this car was built that they started this with the uh, resonator system before. They just had uh, the muffler, and that was that. And then the drive shaft has a stencil on it. I guess that's a part number? Yeah, that's a part number for the drive shaft. And then we look over here at the rear wheel. It's interesting to note that the, 
the caliper on the, the rear disc brake, and this is the part that really makes the car special, mm -hmm. is looks just like the front. Yeah, they look just like the front. I believe the uh, front had bigger rotors than the back, but they still had the same uh, four piston uh, disc brake caliper. And I guess that, that's going to really provide a lot of stopping power for uh, Trans Am racing. Oh, yeah. I know that's oh, why yeah. they, they built yeah. 206 of these. Yeah, a lot better than old drum brakes. And I, I recently learned that of the 206, 179 were on Z28s, but that means that a smaller portion of them were on different kinds of Camaros, but 179 were actually on the Z28. Yeah. Not very many. All right, and over here, David, we got uh, that, that QX code 0519G1. Yeah, yeah, that shows that it was a JL8 rear end car. And you know, too, the rear end is tapered on the ends of the tubes, unlike the stock axles, which are straight, come out straight. Now, I understand that all the ones that were sold over the counter, over the parts counter, just had a straight tube to the backing yes. plate. They weren't tapered yep, like this only car. The, only the ones that got installed in the cars had the tapered uh, And that, that QX 0519G was, was May 19th. The, I believe the Q was the 373 rear, and the X was a was a JL8 four-wheel disc brake. And that, that actual number is stamped on the protective plate. Yep, that's good document. Which tells us this was the original axle mm -hmm. that was in the car when he took liberty. And the owner, Bob Boyette, actually thought this was a 410 rear end because that's what he ordered. Mm -hmm. But came we know this was it came a 373. I was guessing, do you think it's true that because this was built the last week that this option was available, maybe it was take that at that ratio because that's what was available or, or not get it? Yeah, that's probably what it what it was. They just, uh, whatever they had left, I imagine. You know, they that makes sense. Went with it. You took the car out west. Can you talk a little bit about that trip when you took it out west, how that came about? I uh, just wanted to see America, so we took off and drove from uh, New Jersey to California and back. Uh, and the fun thing at that, this is a while ago, uh, the fun thing about that is that several states didn't have speed limits in right. the west. Huh. So. <laughs> <laughs> I first bought the car, and of course I had the protective plate, had the name of the original owner, had the address, so I knew the area where he was located, and I thought, you know, I've got the name, and that's unusual to know who the original owner of a car is that's around 50 years old, and so I actually Googled him. I did a, I did a people search online, found somebody that would have had to have been, or could have been around at that time, had the same first name, same middle initial same last name, from the same general area, and I actually called and left a message on his phone. I had no idea if this person would think I was crazy or ever call back this dealer from Florida that was calling to, to see if he owned a four-wheel disc brake 1969 Camaro that he bought on June 10th. I would say that after I left that message for Bob Boyette, he probably called me within a couple of weeks. It wasn't right away, but it wasn't a long period of time. And when I started talking to him, it was so surprising when I asked him certain questions, he immediately ag agreed that that was probably, I was talking to the original owner and the right person, but I still had to know. I had to ask certain questions to really confirm, is this really the guy? And there's certain questions that he would have to be able to answer to really prove that he was definitively the guy, not just some guy that gets phone calls every time this car changes hands. Bob's an engineer and he's a fairly conservative, quiet person after getting to know him just a little bit. And he just got very quiet when he saw the car, but you could see him reliving the emotion of seeing that car for the first time on the lot back in 1969 when he took delivery. You could almost feel it, the connection when he looked at that car. It was absolutely remarkable. And when we walked around to the back of the car and I was opening the trunk and showing him and I pointed out the decal on the bumper that showed Park Chevrolet of Asbury Park, New Jersey, that was a complete replica of the original bumper sticker that was on the car at the time he took delivery. Once again, he got very, very quiet. I could tell that really took his breath away and really, really made an impact on him. It looked just like my when I bought the car, except it was a little prettier. <laughs> So it's prettier now. Yes.
you'd be driving your car. No. I didn't. <laughs> well, what was it like? Well, we didn't get it up to 140, but. I think it's absolutely important that not only the restoration of classic cars are done, but when we know the story and when we're in a period of time where some of these people are still around to tell the story, that's so critical because people have a passion about cars, muscle cars, particularly Corvettes and Camaros. They feel an attachment, an emotional attachment to the legacy of those cars, the performance of those cars, all the stories of all their buddies or their dads or their friends that grew up with these cars. And when you find out who actually drove the car off the showroom, and here we are well over 50 years after he took delivery, and then he comes and sees the car and is filmed in the car, driving the car, and even signs an affidavit uh, that this is my car and authenticating the car, that's the kind of provenance that gets people excited. He even asked me when he came here what my intentions were with the car. And I told him, I'm not looking to, would I sell the car one day? Maybe, but that's not the idea behind this. I just love the story. The story is so important. When people walk up to the car and you start talking about it and they look at the way it's restored, they look at the color combination, and I can say, that's how Bob Boyette ordered the car, because I, I spoke to Bob Boyette, and he has authenticated that this is his car, and this is how it looked when he took delivery. So when anybody looks at that car, they know that this car is the real deal, 100%. Have a lot of regrets after you sold it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have to think about that one. <laughs>